All right, great. Let's talk about death. Um, or we could talk about the opposite. We could talk about not dying. That's probably a little better. Um, so I was in Vienna the other day. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I was driving by, and I saw this out the side of the uh, car that I was in. I snapped a photo. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this shop? It says oxygen reverse. What's, what's wrong with this? Well, they spelled aging wrong. OK, that's a start. I misspelled aging. Anything else you would expect to see? How about any people? Yes. Like, seriously, if you had a business that could reverse aging, would you expect there to be a line out the door? I mean, look, Tim, Pook, Tim Cook slaps a fourth phone on the back, or fourth camera on the back of the iPhone. We are going to line up around the Apple store and wait for two weeks. But if these guys actually had something that worked, where's the line? I mean, it doesn't even have to like, reverse aging in your entire body, like any part of your body. If you could re reverse age in my knees, I would wait two weeks. Re reverse age in my eye. Hell, I would, I would wait two weeks to reverse age in my eyebrows just so that I could look skeptical at shit like this. <laughs> but the problem when we start looking at things, most healthcare, but certainly uh, uh, longevity, uh, it, it, sound, it seems like science fiction. Right, so I've, uh, I've got three kind of crazy statements up here. We can reprogram our DNA as adults, uh, that we can transfuse blood and actually become younger, or, I mean, we can, uh, you know, take a magic protein and slow aging, um, and it sounds like science fiction. Now, this is why people aren't at the shop. They, they don't believe it. We don't believe it. But, but it's not actually science fiction. It's science that actually works. That actually works in humans. And fiction. Uh, this actually works too. It just doesn't work in humans. Now, if you're a mouse, I've got good news for you. <laughs> but if you're human, eh, we should talk. Um, so uh, this is sort of a tech conference. And the tech industry, uh, actually all industry these days, is a huge beneficiary of Moore's Law. And Moore's law is the reason we can have these tremendous gains in productivity, because the speed and cost are geometric, geometrically improving. And as a result, we have tremendous things. I've got a little supercomputer here uh, right on my ring finger. Um, and by every measurement in life science, Moore's law showed up 30 years ago. We are seeing the geometric improvement. We are seeing, by the way, this, this is, this, slope right here, that's Moore's Law. We're actually doing better than it in some areas, except for one. The dark news is that in life science, they have had to coin the term. I didn't make this up, but you can Google the term. How about after my speech? Eroom's Law. Eroom, E-R-R-O-M, Moore spelled backwards. For some reason, the thing that gives us true science, tested things that we can put in our body is running backwards. We're getting fewer and they're becoming more expensive. Do you know how long it takes for a discovery in the lab to make it on average to an approved drug that you can take safely? How many years? 20 years. Good guess. Good guess. 17, that's good. Yeah. It's actually 36. According to the most recent study we found, uh, we're still living in the 80s. So 36 years is a pretty important uh, number in my life um, because 36 years ago, my mother died from a disease that if she had had it today, would have been curable with two pills. And, um, but, you know, my mom died in 1989. Um, and, and, and when she died, up to that point, I felt there were things I could do. I think I, I thought there were things I could do to help my mother. Um, and um, I was young. I was in my 20s. I didn't really do everything that I could. Um, and I lost my mom. Um, and since that day, and perhaps because of that, um, I have always equated inaction with tragedy. Um, so if you look at my resume, it's crazy. I've done all these, uh, all the, all these nutty things. And, um, I just feel this, 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 this effort to move, this effort to, to sort of attack this. 
because this, if we could eliminate it, would literally save lives. There, is, there are biological pro processes in every one of our bodies right now, everyone in this room, that are absolutely, provably killing us. And in the labs around the world, these discoveries are the solutions. The problem is we can't trust them if they're the fiction. We have to separate the science from the fiction. Otherwise, Moore's law turns into Ebram's law, and we all die. Sorry about the slide. There should be better graphics. But I'm doing this slide, and my six-year-old six daughter walks into the room. And she's like, Daddy. She's learning to read. She's like, Daddy, what's that word? And I said, well, that's an acronym. She's like, what's an acronym? I was like, what's words that stand for other words? She's like, what does it stand for? And I was like, what to fix? Could we somehow attack Erum's law? Could we bring Moore's law, the benefits, back to the world? Well, if you want to attack something, you pretty much understand how, you need to understand how it works. And if you want to understand the process that gives us safe substances that work, then uh, you need to understand that we actually have two systems that give us safe drugs. We have discovery and delivery. Now, discovery is where Moore's Law lives. And discovery, I understand we're having uh, uh, molecular glue presentations later. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Um, these, th that's discovery. All right. Um, then we have to go through this rigmarole where we actually determine if the thing that works on the rat works on a human and works safely, and how do we administer it, and there's, there's all this stuff in the middle. Um, and uh, the best proxy we have for measuring this uh, is to lump it all together and say, what does it cost? Because that's a measure that we can go. And right now, the measure of this cost for all the wonderful discoveries is about $100 million. Now, that does not mean if you have $100 million that you get a safe and approved drug. That means if you have $100 million and some cool thing that molecular glue allows you to create, you get to take a shot on goal. And that $100 million threshold, I believe, is one of the fundamental reasons we're not getting more substances that are tested. So the question is, could we somehow address this problem and maybe get more things over to the side where we actually know they work? There's a problem, and that is idiots. <laughs> so, anyone recognize this? This is a very smart man. A, yeah, this man revolutionized music. He was, by all measures, a brilliant man. But brilliant men, especially rich, brilliant men, when it comes to the world of healthcare, become idiots. Um, so, Michael Jackson publicly stated that he was going to live to 150 years old. Um, and uh, if we think back to how that conversation probably went, you know, Mike, he wasn't, he wasn't a medical professional. He probably hired a doctor. He said, hey, doc, I want to live to 150. And the doc said, sorry, Mike, uh, we don't know how to do that safely. And Mike said, well, you're fired. Send in the next guy. And the next guy comes in. Mike says, hey, I want to live to 150 years old. Doctor says, tell you what, Mike. You pay me a ton of money and sleep in this thing. And by the way, if you have trouble sleeping, I'll give you some propofol. <laughs> and we'll see how it goes. Um, Mike's doctor killed him. Michael Jackson's doctor gave him an overdose of propofol. That's how Michael Jackson died. Um, we make fun of Michael Jackson, another guy I shouldn't make fun of uh, is this guy. Uh, very smart. He probably built the thing that's in your pocket right now. He probably changed the world technically more than any other human. Um, and uh, widely considered a genius. This, did anyone hear his Stanford speech where he told us all that he had pancreatic cancer? Have you read the speech? Have you heard the speech? You remember what Steve said in the speech? He thought he was cured. Steve Jobs, very smart man. He thought he'd beaten pancreatic cancer. Now the question is, did Steve go into the lab and actually figure that out for himself? Or did he have some doctors that told him what he wanted to hear? These people are not idiots. 
in the traditional sense, but we all become idiots when we take money and we try to throw it at healthcare without proper guardrails. Steve thought he'd hired the best physicians, but the problem is if you show up and you have a big check, the people tend to tell you what you want to hear. So we all become idiots. But maybe there's something we can do about this. Maybe there's the power of idiocy that we can apply to the problem of Ebram's Law. Is anyone familiar with the Idiot Index? Oh, you should be. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. A gift from Elon Musk. Elon uses something called the Idiot Index when he tracks what something should cost. So here I have a couple of examples of what the, uh, uh, you know, what some objects in the uh, FDA value chain are. But up at the top, I thought, use something a little more common, cup of coffee. Uh, so a cup of coffee where I live costs about five bucks. That's what you pay if you want to get a cup of coffee. Uh, the ingredients in that coffee cost 10 cents. All right, which means if you wanted to, you could sell a cup of coffee for 50 cents and have an 80% profit margin. Now, if you did that, you would undercut the market price of a cup of coffee by 90%. You would have an order magnitude reduction in the cost of a cup of coffee. But that's because coffee has an idiot index of 50. If we go through the various steps that it takes to take a discovery in the lab and march it through all the steps that it takes to finally become an approved drug and measure the idiot index of each of these steps, you come up with staggering numbers. 300, 100, any number that's higher than 10 means there is, a per, there is a potential reduction of 90%. Um, so if we could do this, if we could somehow take the cost of an approve, a drug approval process down by 90%, well, what you would have is more things getting through, simple economics. There is, of course, a problem with that is that this project that I'm leading is, of course, also being led by another idiot. This is me. I will now prove my idiocy by talking to you about my medicine cabinet. Um, this is my medicine cabinet at my home. Uh, it's full of this shit. Uh, basis, a cellular health optimization. Notice that even put an asterisk <laughs> after optimization. I don't know if you can see the asterisk. Um, but does anyone take this stuff? Come on, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry to out you. Uh, in the room, uh, look, you're not being recorded right now, but dude, stop. Um, it doesn't work. And I'll tell you how I figured out that it doesn't work. It doesn't work because I was um, actually at a lab at a scientific institution where they were studying the mechanism of action of this stuff, and I sort of wanted to join the conversation and seemed a little smart. I said, oh, I take basis. And the scientist looked at me, and he's like, uh, Jim, you know that stuff doesn't work. And I was like, no, 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 no. Um, I got it off a website, and the website had a subscription model, and they had all these scientific papers, which I didn't really understand. Uh, and oh, and then, by the way, they had a Nobel Prize winner on their board. Of course it works. And he's like, no, it doesn't. I can show you the lab. It absolutely doesn't work. Which led me to this crisis of who can I trust? Because I, too, am an idiot. Uh, if I show up, especially if I show up these days with my wallet, uh, people tend to tell me what I want to hear. So it led me to this question of, you know, who can I trust? Who is trustworthy? Um, and uh, I've come up with a very dark answer, and that is nobody. Um, we've seen examples, and I've been in the healthcare space now for about six months, but I've seen dozens and dozens of examples of people showing up, and the money corrupts the science. I've got a guy who spent four, well, I shouldn't tell you how much, damn. Mm, oh, well, many billions of dollars <laughs> endowing an institution. I don't want to out the guy, because uh, he's trying to do good. He, he, he spent many billions of dollars endowing this institution dedicated to medical science and living longer and living healthier. And I interviewed his chief scientist who just quit. And I was like, why'd you quit? He was like, we stopped doing science. Why'd you stop doing science? Well. Every year they had the billionaire show up to reauthorize funds for the organization. And you know what they told him? It's working great. 
who can you trust? I don't think you can trust a who. I think it has to be a what. I think if you're going to trust something, you have to trust science itself. And the problem with science itself is science, especially in life science, doesn't exist in a singular, singular person. You would need an institution. You would need a group of people that has a culture of science because science becomes a culture. It is a culture where you tell the rich guy who might actually write a check to the organization, which was the reason I was at that meeting where they told me I was an idiot, that he's an idiot. You tell him the stuff has worked because it was a doctor. He had the research in his lab to prove that basis doesn't work. Please stop taking it, sir. But this is what we need. So I'm here to give you some good news, because the rest of my presentation is sort of dark. <laughs> there is such an institution. It is the number one medical school in the United States. Actually, number two. Number two by NIH funding. Um, they've got hundreds of billions of dollars of in infrastructure built up over a century. Uh, they have over 1,000 scientists, and they have uh, agreed to attack Eroom's law with us. And they provide a very interesting lever, which I think we can use to lower costs. Because if you look at actually what it costs to do something in an FDA approval process, it doesn't have to be that expensive. Um, the title of the slide, Lever Long Enough, is um, one of my favorite uh, sort of physics quotes. I think it's Archimedes. He said, you know, give me a lever long enough and I will move the world. Remember that? Great quote, except that's not the quote. Um, the quote is, Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. And the place to stand is also very important. The place to stand um, actually has a place for rich idiots. Because if you start to disrupt a system, and you are not rich, and I mean fuck you rich, you're likely to sell out. So let's go back to our example of that cup of coffee that we're trying to sell for 50 cents. If you started selling a cup of coffee for 50 cents, what would likely happen? Who would show up on your doorstep? Maybe Howard Schultz. Yeah, Starbucks would show up. And he would say, sir, your coffee is great. Are you a billionaire? And you say, why, no, I'm not. And he says, well, now you are. I'll take it from here. Um, so what we want to build, and what I am uh, now committing $100 million of my own money to, uh, is a lever long enough and a place to stand. We have the resources of a scientific institution. We have the goal of reducing, however we can, the cost of a shot on goal for all those wonderful substances that you're about to hear some of. And then we have an institution uh, that is, um, that's pairing with us, uh, and we are funded with people who have so much damn money that they're actually in the business of giving away as a try, as, as trying to um, make more. Uh, so uh, this is what I'm doing. Um, and I always try to have an ask when I show up. Um, so here's the ask. Um, like I said, I'm giving $100 million uh, to this. Uh, to most of you, that is going to sound like a ton of money. Uh, to some of you, it might not in which case, see me afterwards. <laughs> but even if you're not, um, we're looking for very angry people. I'm looking for people in the life sciences who have been through FDA approval. I'm looking for people who have had some sort of bad dealing with the machine that we are trying to attack uh, who might want to work with us. So um, that's it. Uh, I'm doing this uh, basically. Uh, because I think if we don't have the cures out of the labs, um, then we're all idiots. So this is the needle. Let's move it.